Welcome to Polk Street United Methodist Church. I'm Leslie Broadbent, the senior pastor here at Polk Street. We want to welcome you to worship with us this morning on this beautiful morning to be inside. We are, uh, we are excited that God has brought all of you here to worship with us, whether you are here in person, whether you're joining with us online or also in our television broadcast, we want to welcome you warmly. If you are here in person, our ushers are going to be handing out our attendance registration pads as they do so. If you would make sure that you register your attendance. After you register your attendance, you can simply pass those uh, pads down the aisle. We recognize as well that we have first-time guests with us this morning. Uh, we do every single worship service, whether you are here in person, whether you are joining with us online or on television. We want you to know that you found a place where you can be yourselves. You found a place where you can grow in your Christian faith and walk you've also found a place where you can develop some lifelong, even generational friendships. That's who we are here as a church at Polk Street United Methodist Church. We have a number of opportunities for ministry as we begin this morning. There in your bulletin, you'll find an insert that has a lot of things going on in the life of our church. One of those coming up this Saturday, we're going to be having a packing day for our snack packs for kids. Here at Polk Street, we provide snack packs for many students at San Jacinto Elementary School. And so today, in, or excuse me, this coming Saturday at 9 o'clock from 9 to around 10.30 or so in room 305, we'll be packing up those snack packs. And so this is a great opportunity for you to reach out in service to our community. And so we hope and pray that you will join with us in that ministry. Also, some of you have been, many of you have been receiving my daily devotional. If you have not been receiving it and you would like to receive it, two things I would ask. First, check your spam folder. Uh, even though it is being sent from me, it's going to my spam folder as well. And so you might check your spam folder. If you are receiving our electronic newsletter weekly, you should be receiving our my daily devotional. Again, those are going out five days a week during the season of Lent at 6 a.m. And so if you would like to receive those, but you are not, make sure that you let us know. You can put down your email address there uh, on those attendance registration pads or uh, send us your email, chat with us there on our uh, Facebook live chat or contact our church office. We would appreciate that. Uh, all, finally, finally, I want you to know that, and some of you have already heard this news, either through uh, Methodist circles or even on the news media, we want you to know that General Conference of the United Methodist Church was postponed yet again. And uh, this General Conference was supposed to happen in 2020, and then it was rescheduled for fall of 2021, and then it was scheduled for fall of 2022. Well, they have postponed it until 2024 you know that there are changes occurring in our denomination. And so the postponement of General Conference, we don't know what that means for us here at Polk Street. We are anticipating here in the next couple of months that we are going to be having some congregational meetings, some larger meetings for us to talk about the issues that are going on in the United Methodist Church. And so we'll be studying those. We'll look at why we, how we got to the point that we are at we will also be looking at the different options that are, before, that are before us here at Polk Street. But there's a couple of things that I want to say to you. First, first, I want you to know that I will lead Polk Street uh, through these next two to five years with, uh, with, with grace, uh, with love, with integrity, uh, with, with the focus on Jesus Christ. Oftentimes, when denominations go through these things, they, we as, as churches and as individuals, as members of churches, sometimes we can get confused about really what is central to our faith. I will do everything that I can as your pastor to make sure that Jesus Christ is the center of our faith. Whatever we are to be about, we know that we are to be about Jesus Christ. The second thing, the second thing that I would tell you is this that Polk Street will continue to be Polk Street. We have been in ministry for the last 134 years, joyfully and faithfully, and, um, well, we've done it with integrity as well. And so we know we are committed to doing the same for the next 100 years. Polk Street is going to continue to be Polk Street. 
We're going to continue to be a church that focuses on Jesus Christ. We are going to be continue to be a church that welcomes all and extends God's grace to everyone. And so know that in the coming months and years, as we think, as we, as we, as we talk about denominational issues, to be honest, I don't know that it will have a whole lot of impact on us here at Polk Street because we're going to be the church that God has called us to be. No matter what the name on the front of the sign is, we're going to be the people that God has called us to be. And so I hope and pray that you will join with me in praying for our beloved United Methodist Church. Today is the first Sunday of Lent. The last time I saw many of you was on Wednesday evening. And I was, we were imposing ashes on your forehead, reminding you that you are dust and to dust you shall return, reminding you that you are mere mortals. As we have begun this fast of Lent, and that's what Lent is, it's a season of fasting. The thing that I love about Lent is that it doesn't include Sundays. Think about that for a moment. Lent is the 40 days before Easter, not including Sundays. Why do we not include Sundays in that fast? Because every Sunday is a day of feasting. Every Sunday is a miniature resurrection day. So if you are here in person, if you would please stand with me. As once again, I remind you why we are here, even in the midst of Lent, we are here because Jesus Christ is alive. Today is a day of fasting on the grace of our Lord Jesus. If you would, turn in your hymnals to number 103, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Number 103. Please remain standing as we go to the Lord in prayer. God of truth, prepare our minds to hear and heed your holy word. Fill every heart that longs for you with your mysterious presence. Almighty Father, with your Son and blessed Spirit, hear our prayer. Teach us to love eternal truth and seek its freedom everywhere. Amen. As you may recognize in our bulletins today, we have a different order of worship. During the season of Lent, we are going to have a different order of worship. It puts an emphasis on different areas of our worship service. And so now is a time for our children's message. So if our kids would come forward, and again, as they are coming forward, I want, you, I want, you to, I want to highlight for you a couple of those changes. 
you know that it, during our other order of service that we have, we really have one way of responding to God's Word in our lives. With this order of worship, we have a number of different ways that we can respond to God's Word in our lives. And so I hope and pray that as we go through this order of service during this season of Lent, you'll recognize that we have so many different ways that we can respond to God's love and grace and Word into our lives. All right, so I have a question for you. So what is something that you prepare for or something that you get ready for? Can you give me an example of something that you get ready or you prepare for? Do you know? What do you think, Maddie? For church, yes. Yeah, that's a very good example. Reese, what do you think? To school. Yes, yeah, school. That's a good one. Yeah, whenever you get ready for school or church, you, you get dressed. You may brush your hair. And then there's a slight chance a few teeth get brushed, right? Okay, yeah. <laughs> I know how it goes in my house. But you, you know that there are certain things that you do to get ready or to prepare for the day, to get ready for school or for church. And um, this time, this during the season of Lent, which started on Ash Wednesday, which was this past Wednesday, the season of Lent is the time for us to prepare or to get ready for Easter. Easter's coming, and Easter's the day that we celebrate when Jesus rose from the dead. He died on the cross three days, and three days later, he rose from the dead. And so what a lot of people do to get themselves ready for that time is they, they might give up something that they really like for that time during Lent, or they may add something to do to help them grow closer to Christ. And during this time, during these 40 days of Lent, um, it is a time for us to grow closer to Christ. And so some people give some things up, and some people might add some things. And I have a challenge for us as Polk Street kids, and I'm going to be doing this too, okay? So I'm this is isn't just instructions for you guys, but I have a challenge for our Polk Street kids for this time during Lent. What I want us to do is this. So last month I talked to you guys about how we need to make every day Valentine's Day. It doesn't need to be just one day of the week. Everybody, we, everybody needs God's love every day of the week. And there are some children and families that are in the country of Ukraine right now. Some of you have heard of that country. Some of you may not have heard of that country. But right now there's kids that are just like you who don't have food right now or maybe don't even, aren't even be able to go to their home right now. And so I got to thinking, okay, God, what's one thing that we can do as kids at our church to help them out? And I thought what might be a good idea is for us to raise money for them. Now, you know, we can't physically go across the country to Ukraine and help them out, but you know what? We may be able to break into our piggy banks and help them out that way, send some money to go help those families. And so I would love for us to do that um, during this season of Lent. And, and even in the scripture that, um, that's going to be read today, it says, Beloved, let us love one another. And that's one way that we can love one another is by sharing some things that we have. We can share some money from our piggy bank and give that to the kids and families that are in Ukraine that need some help right now. They need to see God's love, and that's one way that we can do that. And so in the pews, you know, you see these little envelopes in the pews, so you can put your change in here if you want. You talk to your mommy and daddy about how much you feel like you should give, okay? I don't want you to give your whole piggy bank, but I want us to give something during this time to go to help those families out, and you can write on this envelope. You can write on there, um, Ukraine Kids, and that way the office will know where this money needs to go, and we can help shine God's light um, over there and to help them and maybe feed their bellies with some good food food, okay? All right, so let us pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for this day. Um, if you'll please just help us to, um, to know what we need to do to help those that are in need right now. Help us to show God's love during this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm associate pastor here at Polk Street, Kevin Deckard, and I'm glad to see everyone out here today. I want to invite our ushers to come forward to receive our tithes and offerings. And as they do, we had a busy week here at the church. Our United Methodist men on Wednesday night cooked a pancake and sausage supper, and we raised funds for another Chance House. Many of you were there, and we appreciate your generous donations. I think they raised over $1,600 for that ministry, and uh, we're very thankful for that. Also, the very next night, our Methodist men were down at uh, WT at the Wesley Foundation.
cooking hamburgers for the small group Bible studies, which was another good draw. You got to feed their stomachs before you feed their souls, and uh, had a good turnout, about 100 students for that. And then yesterday, we had several Polk Street members show up at the food bank to sort and box food up for those in need in the panhandle. Thank you for reaching out with the love of Christ to those around us. Let us pray. Lord, we're thankful for this day, and I thank you, God, for the generous congregation that you've raised up here at Polk Street. Thank you, Lord, for these gifts, and ask a blessing that you would use these, Lord, to glorify your name in the name of your Son, Jesus, as we reach out with the love of Christ to our area and on into the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Please remain standing, if you would, for the reading of our scriptures this morning. We have two different scriptures, one out of the book of Genesis, one out of the book of 1 John. Genesis chapter 1 and 1 John chapter 4. Autumn is here to read our scripture for us, found there in your bulletins. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God, also, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Would you bow with me, please? Almighty God, pour out your spirit upon this, your word. and Make it be for us the word of life that we might be people of life. And now, O oh God, hide me behind your cross that your message of love and grace might shine through for the redemption of the world through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I believe that the Oklahoma City Thunder will win a playoff series next year. I believe that Josh Giddy, their the rookie this year, one day is going to make the All-Star team. I believe, I believe that in three years there's going to be a relatively unknown politician who's going to be elected president of the United States. I believe Mike Gundy will retire unexpectedly within the next, next five years as the football coach of Oklahoma State. Now, these are simply my predictions, but these are things that I, that I believe. I also believe in other things. I believe in hard work. I believe in loyalty and perseverance. I believe in family and faith. Or in the words of the immortal country and Western artist Don Williams, my favorite, I don't believe in superstars, organic food, or foreign cars. I don't believe the price of gold, the certainty of growing old, that right is right and left, and left is wrong, and that north and south can't get along, that east is east and west is west, but being first is always best. But I believe in love. I believe in babies. I believe in mom and dad, and I believe in you, he writes. So what do you believe in? What do you believe in? It's easy to say what we believe or think about our favorite athletic teams. It's common for us to have thoughts on politics or what we saw on the news or in our modern culture. And many of us are more than ready, more than ready to talk about our beliefs, sometimes five or ten or even 50 times a day on social media. Yes, I follow you on social media. But there are other beliefs, things that go deeper than maybe our, our predictions or what we might think of our culture. There are same, some things that are, that are core beliefs, that are core beliefs. You know, I might change my mind about Mike Gundy if Oklahoma State wins a Big 12 title in the next couple of years. I will certainly change my belief about the thunder if the plethora of draft picks that they have stored up, if, if, none, of them, if none of them pan out. But there are, there are some beliefs that are so core to who I am that no matter what, 
no matter what, I will always, and I mean always, have those beliefs. Now, a belief is more than just a cognitive assent to something that is true or an acceptance that something is a fact. For example, I believe that the astronauts really did land on the moon. I believe that E equals MC squared. Not that I know what that means, but I still, but I still believe it. Another, another definition of a belief is a confident trust or faith in something. A belief is a confident trust or a, or a faith in something. For example, when you're sick or hurt, it's important that you believe in your doctor. You need to have faith and trust that your doctors in your doctor's abilities as a physician. The, the, the first is simply a mental activity. The saying that something or a, a, it's saying that something is simply true and calling that a belief. It's simply a mental activity. However, the second, the second entails entails faith. The second, I believe, even even implies a, a, a lifestyle. If we believe in our doctor, then we will trust what she says. We will put our faith in our doctor. And I hope that through this series. Through this sermon series, when we truly affirm the Apostles' Creed, we will live our lives differently. We will live as people of trust and of faith. So today, during this season of Lent, beginning today, during this season of Lent, we are going to be examining the Apostles' Creed. Now, many of us, we, ha- we recite the Apostles' Creed. By the way, you likely have noticed that we haven't recited the Apostles' Creed yet. The first response that you will be given, uh, that you will have an opportunity, the first way that you will have an opportunity to respond to God's Word in our lives today is for us to stand here in a few moments and to recite the Apostles' Creed. That will be the first response called for from God's Word this morning. Many of us we recite the Apostles' Creed every single Sunday. Sunday, many of us have even we've memorized the Apostles' Creed when we were small children. But have you ever had those instances in your life when you're driving down the road and all of a sudden you realize you've driven five miles and you have no idea what's happened in the last five miles? You just have just mentally you've checked out. For many of us, for many of us, when it comes to the Apostles' Creed during a worship service, that's what we do. We do it every single Sunday or almost every Sunday or whether it's the Apostles' Creed or another creed. Uh, we, we have the creed every Sunday, and some of us, we just check out when we affirm the Apostles' Creed. And so this series is, is intended for us to, uh, to really begin to take to heart what we are affirming and to recognize that the Apostles' Creed makes a difference, not just in our faith. I believe the Apostles' Creed makes a difference in our lives. So, First, we're going to examine a couple things generally about the Apostles' Creed, and then we're going to look exactly, uh, we're going to look what we affirm in that first statement of the Apostles' Creed. So why is the Creed important? Why is the Apostles' Creed important? Well, in the early church, there were a number of heresies that were popping up. False beliefs about God and about, and about the Holy Spirit and about Christ were beginning to arise in the early church. Some people said that Jesus was only a spirit. He was like a ghost without a physical body. Others in the early church said that Jesus was a a mere human who somehow became a God. Others said, uh, and and others others debated uh, about, about about the meaning of the resurrection meaning that the resu- some said that the resurrection really was a myth that was made up by the early church. There were others who debated the, the nature of the Holy Spirit. The Apostles' Creed was written to a- around the year 120 to combat these false beliefs or these heresies that were arising in the early church. The Apostles' Creed was not written by the Apostles was not written by the 12 apostles. However, it reflects what the apostles taught. It only contains between 109 and 114 words, depending on the version that you use. It's a very brief summarization and a broad survey of apostolic doctrine. It's Trinitarian. 
in that it affirms God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It is not comprehensive, but everything that it covers is vital to our Christian faith. And those things that it covers is common among all Christians, at least until around uh, the last 100 years. And we began to debate some of the things that, were, that are included in the Apostles' Creed. Again, everything that it includes is central to our faith. But I would also say not everything that is central to our faith is included in the Apostles' Creed. But it is vital to our faith. It is vital to our faith. The Apostolic Creed is the most common statement of faith among all churches around the world. And I would suspect that on this day, there are more Christians reciting the Apostles' Creed on this day than anything else in all of the world. There are some churches, some churches that say that they are non-credal in nature, meaning they have no statement of faith other than the Bible. When the Reformation occurred in the 16th century, uh, the, the Reformers believed that there was something wrong with the church. And when I say the church in the, in the 16th century, there were really two churches. One was the Eastern Church, we know as the Eastern Orthodox Church, and one was the Western Church, we know as the Catholic Church. And the Reformers recognized that there was something deeply wrong in that church. There was there were some wrong actions, there were some wrong beliefs that had arisen over uh, the previous 15 centuries, and so there were some wrong things in that church. And so the Reformers, John Calvin and Martin Luther, they began to go back to the Bible, and they began to see that there were some things in the church that were practices of the church that they couldn't find in the Bible. And so they began to reform the church. And so if you go into uh, many churches, including uh, the United Methodist Church, the Lutheran Church, the Presbyterian Church, we will feel very Catholic, Roman Catholic in our worship. There are a number of things that we do in our worship services that are similar to the Roman Catholic tradition. However, if you go into other churches, there is nothing that feels like the Roman Catholic Church in those churches. They are non-credal, meaning that they, have, they are descendants of the radical reformers. Those radical reformers believed that Martin Luther and John Calvin, they didn't go far enough. And so radical reformers came along and they got rid of anything that even, that even scented of Roman Catholicism. And so they got rid of, they got rid of, uh, of common songs like the doxology and the Gloria Patre. Many of them stopped reciting the Lord's Prayer. They stopped reciting the creeds. And they said this, no creed but the Bible. And that's a wonderful motto. And oftentimes it works beautifully. The problem arises, however, is that the Bible is a large document written over thousands of years. And sometimes when we read through the, when we read through the Bible, sometimes we can get confused. Does anyone ever get confused reading the Bible? <laughs> We get confused reading the Bible, and sometimes we wonder, then, what is the central tenet of our faith? Do we take the, the core of our faith from the, from the book of Daniel? Do we take the core of our faith from the book of Revelation? Do we take the core of our faith from the book of Deuteronomy? Do we take the core of our faith from the gospel accounts? So the creed helps us to know what is the core of our faith. What are the essential aspects of our faith? The key phrase in the book of Judges, although written over 3,000 years ago, could have been written today. It says this, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Everyone did what was right in his own, own eyes. That could have been written about our, common, our, our modern culture. It would be hard to find a more fitting description of modern American life. If you ask people on the street, what do you believe? you will receive a bewildering array of answers. In fact, I suspect that if you ask United Methodists across America, what do, you, what do you believe? You'll receive a bewildering array of answers. Consider this quote from a 20-something backpacker 
in Boston when he was asked when he was asked what he believed. He said, I don't know what I believe in and if I believe. I believe there's some higher power, I think, but I don't know. Like, like right now, I'm at a point where I don't know what to believe and I'm, I'm open to believe in everything. So I like to believe in everything because I don't know what it is I truly believe in. I think he speaks for a generation for a generation that is ready to believe in everything. And why not? When you don't know what you believe, why not be open to everything? And so, that's what the Apostles' Creed helps us to do. It helps us to know what we as Christians believe beyond anything else. There may be other things that we believe in, but at the very least, This is what we believe. This is what we put our trust in. This is what we put our faith in. So the opening words of the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so there are really three affirmations in that first statement. Let's look at each one of those. So as we begin, again, the Creed first asserts that we believe that God is almighty. God is almighty. Now, this is different. This affirmation that God is almighty is different from other ancient religions and even some modern religions. Some some say that if there is a higher higher power, well, this higher higher power does not have much power because of all the evil in this world. It's as if this higher power is like a watchmaker who makes a watch winds, puts the watch together, assembles the watch together, winds that watch and lays the watch on their desk and sits back and watches and, and sees how that, how that watch just kind of goes about its business. Some believe that that's the kind of God that we have, a watchmaker kind of God that's not interactive with us, a, a, a watchmaker God that really is not all that powerful because there's so much evil in this world. In saying that God is almighty, in saying that God is almighty, we are saying that God is all-powerful. Our creed says that God is almighty, and in saying that God is almighty, we are saying that somehow, mysteriously, God is in charge. We are saying, somehow, mysteriously, that God is in charge. Now, certainly, this does not mean that God causes everything to happen, but ultimately, God is in charge, and God is almighty. God is almighty, and we must remember that God is almighty when we are facing insurmountable obstacles, when we, are, when we are facing decisions, when we are facing tragedies, God is almighty. In the end, it's going to work out because God is almighty. If you are here on Ash Wednesday, you may recall the words of my, of my dear friend Ginger as she was facing death. She said, Pastor, it's going to be okay. Because you see, she affirmed that God is almighty. When we come across tragedies and, and, and again, decisions and, and, and obstacles in our life, we must affirm that God is almighty. Now, in saying this, we're not, it, we're not saying that we, that we should simply throw up our hands in resignation. Well, God's in control. I guess there's nothing we can do about it. No. In affirming that God is almighty, we are saying that God is working with us and for us. God is almighty. We believe in an almighty God. We also believe, we also believe that this almighty God is creator. Or more appropriately, God is creating. God is creating. In that passage in Genesis 1 that was read earlier, it affirms that God created the universe, all that is seen and unseen. It wasn't a fluke. It wasn't a fluke that the world came into being. It wasn't simply an accident that humans evolved from the molecular soup of early creation. No, God was intentional in creation. And this is a different perspective than the ancient religions of of the ancient Near East or of our modern religions of cynicism and doubt. 
No doubt we have lots of questions. Why did God create rattlesnakes and mosquitoes and Brussels sprouts? I have no idea. I don't know. But God had some reason. But God not only is creator, God is creating. God is creating. Even today, God is creating, and most often, God uses you and me to help create music and poetry and art, sciences, philosophies, medicines. God is using you and me to create and to create a better world, to create a more just world, to create a, a, a more loving world, to create a world in which people are drawn to God. God is creating and we must remember that when we are facing decisions and, and obstacles and tragedies in our lives, we must remember that God is a creating God, that God is working on our behalf. There is no problem. Hear me, friends. There is no tragedy. There is nothing in this world that is too complex for God because God is a creator God. We, we affirm that God is almighty, that God is creating but we also affirm that God is love. Now, you may be scratching your head a little bit and saying, well, that first phrase, it doesn't say anything about God being love, does it? No, it doesn't. But it does call God Father. Now, this language, this Father language has created a, a significant angst among some in our postmodern culture. Some say using masculine, masculine language about God says something about the nature of God, that God is a man or like our heavenly fathers or, or like our earthly fathers. And that's a problem for many people. Those who had dads who were less than honorable struggle to see God as father. Those who have, those who have been abused by men struggle to see God as a man. And to be honest, I'll be honest, we all have daddy issues. It's one of the things that I've noticed as I've gotten and even surpassed middle age, we've all, we've all got daddy issues. We've all got daddy issues. Even those who had incredible dads, we all have our issues. But saying that God is Father isn't, much of a, isn't as much of a statement that speaks to who God is, but rather calling God Father speaks to a relationship speaks to a relationship. It says that God loves us like a father loves his children. God's relationship, again, is, is, like, a, is like a loving father, kind and loving, protecting and supporting, persistent and challenging, challenging us to be kind, be, be the kind of people we have potential to be. God is loving. And in this passage of, from 1 John, it goes beyond that and says that God is not only loving, God is love. So when we call God Father, we are saying that God is love. During the most difficult times of my life, there are times that I have doubts. I have significant doubts. Sometimes I even doubt what I do as a pastor. <laughs> I'm not even sure what I'm doing as a pastor. I, I don't know. I don't know anything, but I, but I tell people there are two things that I know. There are always two things that I know. One, we have an almighty God. And two, we have a loving God. We have a loving God, and when you put those two things together, that we have an almighty, all-powerful God, and we have an all-loving God, sisters and brothers, it is only going to be good news for us. It's only going to be good news. No doubt there's going to be tragedies. No doubt there's going to be difficulties. No doubt there's going to be unanswered questions, but I know this, it's all going to be okay, as my friend Ginger said. Because we have an almighty, we have a creating, we have a loving God. So as we stand and affirm and recite the Apostles' Creed, we are saying that no matter what, 
no matter what tragedies come our way, no matter what difficulties we find in this world, no matter how many pandemics we live through, no matter how many wars and rumors of wars there are in this world, we have an almighty, creating, loving God. And so now, in response to God's word in our lives, would you please stand with me as we join together in affirming our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As we prepare our hearts for Holy Communion, I would ask that you would turn in your hymnals to page number 12 in your hymnals. And I want to remind you that this is not our table. This is not the United Methodist table. This is the Lord's table. And Jesus Christ came not for just the Methodists, praise God. Jesus Christ came for the Baptists and the Presbyterians and the Lutherans and the Catholics. Jesus Christ came for all of the world. And so all are invited to this table, all those who earnestly repent of their sins. Christ our Lord invites to this table all who love Him, who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Let's join our hearts and our voices together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved You with our whole heart, We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. As we continue on page 13 in the great thanksgiving, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after the supper, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink of this, all of you. This is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it. And so now, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves as praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here 
and upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Christ was broken, that we might be whole. Christ was emptied, that we might be filled. I would ask that those who will be assisting with communion, if they would come forward. As they are coming forward, I want to remind you of a, of a couple of uh, announcements and instructions this morning. As you come forward for communion, if you would please come forward during the, uh, through the, uh, down the center aisles and then return to your seats up the outside aisles, we would appreciate that. We have a gluten-free station for communion over on your far right-hand side. As you come forward for communion, you'll simply receive a cup, you'll receive a, a, a piece of bread, and you can, you can partake of those elements either at the altar rail where you are, or you can also go back to your seats and partake of those, uh, of those elements. When you come forward, if you would like to kneel at the altar, you're invited to come and pray as long as you would like. If you would like for me to pray for you or to pray with you, I'll be available over on your right-hand side. I'll have some anointing oil. I would be so honored to pray for you and to pray with you. As a response to having communion with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we now have an opportunity to commune with him in prayer. You'll find some prayer concerns listed on the back of your bulletin, and I'm aware that we all have other prayer concerns and joys to lift up to the Lord today. You'll have an opportunity to do that during our prayer time. Also, if you feel led, and you would like to light a candle for somebody that you're lifting up to our Lord, we remember that Jesus is the light of the world, and he is concerned about every detail of our lives. You can do that any time during the prayer time today. We're going to have a moment of silence to begin our prayer time, and we also invite anyone to come and join us at the altar rail for prayer. Let us pray. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before you with humble hearts, seeking your face this morning. We look to you for your mercy, love, and grace, not only for ourselves, but for those we are concerned about. We thank you for your promise to be with us always, to never leave us or forsake us. Your love is truly amazing. This morning, as we share, as we have shared in your communion table, O oh God. We pray for unity in the body of Christ throughout the world. We pray for our individual agendas and wills to be set aside for your perfect plan and will to be done in and through your church. Help us to reflect the light of your son Jesus so that many would come to a saving and personal relationship with him. As candles are lit for loved ones, we pray that this will be a fragrant aroma lifted up to your throne of grace. Help us to see those who are far from you through your eyes and with your compassion. 
May your spirit empower us to accomplish great things for your kingdom. We pray for the people of Ukraine and ask you, according to your power and mercy, to stop the attacks from Russia. We pray for peace throughout the world. Lord, we pray for seven of our sister United Methodist churches and their pastors in our district. Amarillo Community of Grace and Nancy Moore, Amarillo Faith Southwest and Mark Welsheimer, Canadian First and David Gearhart, Dumas First and Laquita Jones, Headley and Memphis, Stan Cosby, Miami and Jean Hudgens, Stratford and Kevin Phillips. Now, Lord, we hear the names from this congregation who need your healing and your grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. now go as those who affirm, believe in, and trust in an almighty, creating, loving God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.